five. Uh, it'll be about an hour. It's going to start in about five minutes. And today I'm going to take your questions, autism related questions. I am also going to cover play skills and how to teach children with autism play skills. Um, so I'm going to be covering that important topic as well. So let me um, put on the five minute timer, let people get here and um, we will get started in about five minutes.
it's Dr. Mary Barbera. So happy Monday. It is Monday at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Every Monday I've been coming on here live to answer your autism questions. And also each week I do try to provide you with some um, tips or some talk. Today I am going to talk all about play skills and social skills in children with autism and children with signs of autism. And I'm going to get to that in just a few moments. I just want to get people settled and make sure you can hear me. And if you feel comfortable, if you in the comments can tell me if you're a parent, professional, grandparent, um, just a friend, just someone who's interested in autism, let me know where you're viewing from. And if you have any autism questions, if they're related to social and play skills, even better, I can tie that into the presentation today. So um, let me just check on the, so we have um, many people here. We have um, Kimberly uh, from Queens, New York, and she is almost finished with the toddler online course. So for those of you that don't know me, I fell into the autism world in the late um, 1990s when my firstborn son, Lucas, uh, was showed signs and then was diagnosed with autism one day before his third birthday. Um, I've gone on to become a board certified behavior analyst, worked with thousands of children and trained uh, hundreds of thousands of people around the world, either in person and then uh, through my online course. I also published a book, The Verbal Behavior Approach, um, which is available in 13 languages. I've traveled the world. I've um, So the, the last five years though, I have been concentrating on getting my procedures out via online courses and free, uh, Facebook lives like this, free video blogs every week, and a free podcast, Turn Autism Around is the name of my podcast. I'm also in the process of writing a second book, which will be out in April. So uh, lots of great things happening on my end. So this woman uh, is from the toddler course and toddler community. So if you are sitting there thinking, okay, so how does this work? How would I go about learning more about your online course? The best place I know where to send you actually is, let me see if I can pull this up on my screen. Always a um, little challenging. Um, okay, let's see what this says. If I pull this up, well, this will take you to a three-step guide. Um, which is fine. You can get a free three-step guide. But I, what I was hoping to show you was marybarbera.com forward slash quiz will get you really to the right spot of taking the quiz. Make sure you watch the, the correct uh, webinar, which can tell you how to, you know, handle some of the common mistakes you might be making. And then also... Um, it'll, it'll, uh, tell you more about my online courses and community. I see we have Danielle here. She's a BCBA in New Hampshire. She's also within our online course and community. Um, and I have a couple team members here too. So they may be posting links that I mentioned. Um, I'm trying to, you know, deal with technology and the content and answer your questions. So if you have a question, um, feel free to put it in the comments and we will get to those and then I'll get to the content, which is how to teach play and social skills to children with autism. Okay, so um, let me just look, see what questions we have, if any. Um, okay, and we have Heather's a BCBA, a grandmom from Virginia. I have a podcast, uh, uh, interview that I did with uh, Grandma Diane, who took my toddler course and made really great strides with her grandson. Um, we have a school psychologist, also from Virginia, uh, somebody from New Jersey, Southern New Jersey. I'm hoping to actually go to the beach this weekend. Um, beaches are starting to open, fingers crossed. Um, we are nine, 10 weeks into the pandemic shutdown. Some of my previous video blogs, I started these 
these Facebook Lives um, right before COVID hit back in February. So um, some of my topics for the last couple of Mondays have been on how to teach hand washing, how to um, do telehealth better um, in terms of teletherapy, those sorts of things. Um, okay, so uh, we have a question here. How, how can I assist verbal children on the autism spectrum to express themselves if they have minimal verbal skills? Um, so as you will learn from the discussion today about play skills is that language is a behavior just like any other behavior and it can and should be taught very systematically. Most typically developing kids don't need any uh, direct instruction on teaching, but many uh, children with autism do. So um, we need to teach them at every step of the way. Uh, and we need to make sure that we have um, a strong focus on manding or requesting. So if a child can mand or request for items, for attention, for information eventually, um, they will have much better conversational skills and communication skills. So for young children, I have a toddler preschooler course and for um, toddlers through teens, even young adults who have uh, minimal verbal abilities, not conversational, I have the verbal behavior bundle, which is a whole um, series of videos of me working with kids with autism and others working with kids with autism, some without autism. And we show you step-by-step step how to teach verbal skills, how to teach comprehension, how to teach potty training, sleep, feeding issues, uh, desensitization to the doctors. Dennis, we just had a member post in our closed community and she said that all of a sudden her daughter uh, was having trouble uh, taking a bath. She was, she was having major problem behaviors related to that. And, um, so, so, you know, we gave her some ideas. There's a desensitization bonus video within our courses. So anyway, that is, uh, you know, it's a complicated question. Like how to teach child to talk is, is depends on where they're at, what their age level is, how much they are talking. Um, and we go through that. We go through that. We'll go through that with play skills today. We go through that in a lot of my video blogs about how to teach kids to talk or to talk more or to become conversational. Um, if you just want to search around, I know uh, some members of my small team are posting some links, but if you want to learn, say you have a question about conversational skills or how to get the first word or anything. Just, just type in Mary Autism and whatever you're struggling with. Uh, how to get first words, how to reduce stimming, whatever your situation is, you'll find out, you know, what I have to say on it. Okay. Um, so we do have a couple questions on play, how to increase a toddler's desire to want to be social and engage with others. Currently almost four years old, we'll just walk away from peers if we try to engage with him. So we're going to cover all that. Um, Varsha just finished module four of the intermediate course. Excellent. Uh, main concern is individual playtime, how to increase that. She also needs a play buddy. Um, and how do I get my child to engage with other children? Great. So all of those will be covered today. So why don't we, instead of, uh, just taking more individual questions, why don't I do my presentation? Um, my, uh, small team will, will post some, some links as I talk. And then after I'm done, um, with the presentation, I will come back to you and answer any final questions, uh, at that point. Okay, so today's session is all about autism and play skills. And when we think about autism and play skills, we're talking um, about, there's two types of play. There's independent play, and those are your leisure activities. And then there's social play, and that is play involving other people. Today, I'm going to focus mostly on that social play component um, 
because we do tend to teach these these things uh, separately and we want our children to be as social as possible and we want them to use language and we want to pair this all up together so uh, today we are covering mostly that social play component and it's really hard to separate out play versus social versus language and many of my free and paid resources all focus heavily on language um, because what I have found is um, it's really hard to build adequate social and play skills without the language to support it and it's easier and um, it's easier for me to teach parents and professionals how to teach language and then um, the social and play skills will will be taught in 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 sync with that um, okay so as we all know uh, autism is characteristically diagnosed with a failure to socially communicate social communication skills wrote repetitive interests are also usually part of the diagnosis so that play and social piece is largely missing from kids who are diagnosed or showing signs of autism. I am also going to talk about this book that I got. It's published in 1997. I bought it at a conference. I saw the authors present on this book. I think it was 2000 and I bought the book for like 40 bucks. The good news is you can download this book um, for free and my uh, staff will post the link for that in the comments or in the show notes. Um, so, but stay with me here because this link isn't going anywhere. You're going to be able to download this and I'm going to cover the pieces of this book that I would highly recommend. But most of you listening are actually probably have kids or clients that are not ready for this kind of uh, in explicit instruction on play and social skills. So I'm also going to cover some of the prerequisite skills uh, to get us going. So as you know, or just found out, I fell into the autism world in 1999 uh, when my son was diagnosed with autism one day before his third birthday. His name is Lucas. He's now 23 years old. And when Lucas was two years old, um, when he was 21 months, my husband first mentioned the possibility of autism and I shut him down. I told him I never wanted to hear the word again. And we had a second baby right away. So when Lucas was 18 months old, we had Spencer. And so um, Lucas was, was warm and cuddly with me. He had some language, but at the time I knew nothing about how to teach language. I had nothing, I knew nothing about how to teach play skills. Um, and so we thought maybe Lucas would perk up and start really playing with kids better and start talking more if we enrolled him in a, um, toddler preschooler class, which was a two year old preschooler class. Um, in our neighborhood and um, Lucas just turned two in July so the so the class started in September so there were you know newly turned two-year-olds like Lucas and then there were two year th two and a uh, two and three quarter year olds almost three years old there were some kids in there that turned three right in October so there was a wide range of abilities and going from a two-year-old to a three-year-old, that is an explosive age in terms of play and language. So um, Lucas had very few words. Like I said, I didn't know how to teach new world words. And I know now he was not diagnosed with autism. And besides my husband mentioned the possibility of autism, he, we, you know, once uh, no one was thinking or talking about autism for Lucas. Um, so he would go to this little toddler class and, you know, he would, wouldn't have a problem separating. Some of the other kids had major separation anxiety. Some of the other kids had major aggression when other kids took their toys. Lucas wouldn't really care if somebody took a toy out of his hand. He would just kind of go to the next toy. Um, he would enjoy the little sing-songy, 
you know, circle time, but if it got too heavy with language, he um, was not attentive. He wasn't rolling around on the floor or running out of the classroom, but it became clear mid-year that Lucas was falling behind. And that's when the teacher and the preschool director brought us in, my husband and I, and um, they basically said Lucas was, uh, they used words like in his own world and he wasn't uh, really participating much. He did like to paint and he did like to do the instruments with the shaking, with the songs that he was familiar with. But uh, there was no... Um, you know, understanding of a lot of the language. And they were worried that um, it was time for enrollment for the three-year-old class. And they were worried about him moving up there, um, that, you know, it was a worse staff to student ratio in the toddler course. You know, they didn't have to be potty trained in the three-year-old course classroom. They did. The staff, you know, there's only one teacher, so there was no way that teacher could leave to change a diaper or anything. So potty training is one of the barriers. And so Lucas stayed back in two-year-old preschool. And in that in that um, year, he was diagnosed right before he turned three. So he repeated the two-year-old preschool. And he went with an ABA therapist, right, uh, who shadowed him. And... You know, a lot of people that I see with little kids with autism or signs of autism, um, some of them don't have a choice. Like they work and they need childcare and the child is in daycare all day. Um, but studies have shown, lots of studies have shown for many decades that kids with autism really need intensive one-on-one -on -one ABA. And just having a one-to-one -one person shadow you around um, and prompt you and make sure you don't hit anybody and make sure you don't roll around on the floor. That's not the kind of instruction kids need. Kids need very systematic instruction on language and play skills and imitation and all those sorts of things. So Lucas did get uh, 40 hours a week of ABA, including these two mornings a week where he continued to go to preschool. And for him, that was uh, a good thing. Um, because he already knew the routine, he was comfortable with the teacher, and he had an ABA therapist there who would make sure that he, you know, was fairly focused and didn't make a mess with the paint and didn't um, get into any trouble. And he continued to progress to the three-year-old preschool and the four-year-old preschool, and he went to typically developing preschool. Um, some kids with autism that when they're young they go to special needs preschool which was an option for lucas but we chose to do home aba and this typical preschool opportunity but you know i had some clients who went um into special needs preschool and and what i found was sometimes the one-to-one -one, you know environment wasn't good there was you know eight kids and and two teachers or three or four teachers and aides, but that's still not a one-to-one -one ratio. And so there was very little pullout time. I had one mom of a boy, I'll call him Adam, and he went to special needs preschool, but he was off every Friday. So mom thought just to expose him into a, a typical daycare on Fridays was, was going to be a good thing. But when I started with Adam, I observed him at home and in the special needs preschool. And I went to daycare on a Friday and he was in his own world. The kids around him were, were just, uh, running around, negotiating play. Um, he was in his own world. And at one point he even, he didn't have a one-to-one -one when I was there. And even at one point he started licking the wall and I had to, of course, get up and stop that. But, you know, little Adam didn't make any progress for a whole year in this. Um, and he went from age three to age four, making no progress. And so one of the very common mistakes I see both parents and professionals making is, is they think that just exposing kids to other typically developing kids is going to make social and play skills come naturally. And it involves a lot of work. And it usually involves a lot of work with teaching language. So I have done several other 
video blogs and podcasts. I did podcast number 17 on social skills. Podcast number 18, I had a guest, Ashley Rose, who teaches social skills uh, instruction to older kids usually. And I also did a couple of video blogs on mistakes people make with social skills and also how to teach both independent and social play skills, which you may want to check out. Um, so in addition to thinking exposure is the answer, exposure to other kids and thinking that social skills will come naturally, um, those are the, the two big um, mistakes and as well as programming too high for social skills, working on things like manners and turn taking and greetings and sharing and saying, I'm sorry, before a child has these prerequisites, which are really baby infant type of um, social and play skills. So let's talk about how typically developing babies, what kind of play and social skills they have. So babies and typically developing toddlers, and I, I am saying this because if you have a two, a three, a 12 year old that doesn't have these baby skills of being social and playing, it's gonna be really hard to get to the good stuff in this Playtime Social Time book, which I'm gonna talk about in a few minutes. So babies, uh, eye contact, cooing, smiling at a caregiver's face. Um, when you point, the, the infant or toddler should be following your point. They should start pointing between 12 months and by at the very latest by 18 months. And this isn't just like a point here or there. This is a point a lot. Every day you see pointing in a 12 month old to 18 month old. Um, you have to see pointing, reaching, gesturing. If a baby or in a toddler takes your hand and puts it on an item, that's called hand leading and that's actually a red flag for autism. So lack of pointing, hand leading are red flags um, by 18 months of age. But um, the young, typically developing uh, 12 month old, 15 month old, 18 month olds also bring you things to show you, to get your attention. Um, Okay, if you are familiar with the VB map assessment, which I talk about a lot in my verbal behavior bundle cor courses, uh, the play skills in the zero to 18 month uh, level include putting items in, stacking blocks, um, sitting on the floor or at a table, um, and attending to, you know, being aware when people walk in the room, being aware when people call their names. I did a video blog on, on response to name, which tends to be another red flag for autism. Um, looking at faces, not just eye contact, but at your face, being aware. So when a uh, typically developing baby, you know, spills milk or whatever, um, they would, you know, say an 18 month old spills milk or spills water. Um, they would look at their parent, look down at the mess, like, oh gosh, what are we going to do kind of thing to negotiate that, um, where a child with autism might just start playing in the water, just more of that cause and effect kind of thing. Also when tested with bubbles, for instance, when you blow bubbles and you put it back in and okay, your turn, um, a typically developing child would be looking at you like, come on, you know, even if they're not talking, they would be looking at you, reaching, uh, giving you the bubbles, looking at your eyes to see if it was okay, if you were going to do it. Um, where a uh, child with signs of autism will just hand the bubbles back to you, to your hand, and, and kind of require the hand to do all the movement to get the bubbles going again. Okay, so those are kind of those, one of the things that people don't realize is that you really need to have some attention the child needs to be sitting and attending. I am a big fan of bringing very little kids, once they can sit safely, um, out of the high chair, out of a strapped booster seat. If you have to do that for a young child or even a child with physical disabilities um, to keep them in the high chair or in a strapped in chair for safety, that's great, that's fine. 
but once they can freely walk and run and sit and have balance to sit at a small child size table, I do find that my approach revolves around pairing that table time up to be so much fun. And we are teaching language, we're teaching cooperation, we're teaching sitting skills, attending, um, we're teaching beginning language skills. What I find is that some early intervention professionals, me included, uh, when I was an early intervention professional, um, I would often go in and if the parents didn't have a table or didn't want to use a table, I would spend a lot of my time just chasing the child around the house trying to, you know, hold up a picture of a cat or a little toy figurine of a cat and saying cat once or looking out the window and trying to get the child's attention, look at the tree. Um, there simply just wasn't enough time of focused attention to really improve language so much. Okay, once you have those beginning language skills, which are covered more in depth uh, in the toddler course, as well as the early learner course, which is part of my verbal behavior bundle of courses, then we get um, to teach or we the child naturally develops uh, skills such as sharing, turn-taking, greetings, pretend play, uh, understanding rules of games, negotiating, um, cooperative play with others, imitating others, playing games like Simon says, then playing board games and, and those sorts of things. Also an advanced uh, social play skill is, is using manners, saying please and thank you. That comes much later. Saying sorry, I see that often. I did a video blog on saying sorry where, um, you know, a, a child with very little language, little to no language hits someone and then they're, they're being explained to why hitting is bad and say, I'm sorry. They have, you know, hardly any words. And now they're um, being prompted to say, I'm sorry. They just don't understand the whole thing. So we not only have to look at delays in expressive language, but also what, what they're comprehending, their receptive language. Um, and some families have no choice. They, their kids are in daycare all day long or they are in preschool or at a caregiver's house all day long. And, um, but if you really do want to catch the child up and, and get them to their fullest potential, um, they're going to need most likely some serious one-to-one -one instruction. Most research shows that kids with a diagnosis of autism need at least 25 hours per week of intensive one-to-one -one ABA instruction. And that's a lot of time. That's, you know, Lucas had 40 hours a week. And I don't see my approach trains the parents first and foremost and always keeps them in the captain's seat. And then uh, they know how. They know how much therapy. It's basically we want to engage the child for all of their waking hours, as many of their waking hours as possible. Their waking hours is something like 100 hours per week. And even for older kids, we want to keep them as engaged as possible. Um, we are in the middle, uh, at the time where I'm recording this, in the middle of the COVID shutdown, um, where parents are, you know, really struggling to keep their kids with autism, um, especially their older kids, engaged for long periods of time. Um, there's a lot of free access to screen time and, the, and that is leading to lots of stimming, lots of uh, regression in some cases, which is, is so tough for parents. So um, to get to those higher skills of using manners and being flexible and, and uh, using language in the natural environment, um, we have to make sure we have those prerequisite skills, the ability to sit and learn, the, the, the wanting to be with you. We don't, we can't teach kids how to be social and play if they're trying to get away from us, trying to get back to their iPad. And so we, we have to do it very systematically, make table time super fun, make it 
so reinforcing that the child is literally running to the table. I used to have clients where they would, I would show up and they would go to the table and, and dra try to drag the table out. That's how excited they were to see me and to get to the materials, which we go over um, in my courses. But now let's get to this playtime social time book. As I said in the beginning of the session, this playtime social time book was written in 1997. I paid about $40 for it. I saw the authors present at a conference. And what it does is it lays out the importance of teaching play skills and starting on page um, 90, 92, um, we start with 20 different activities in this playbook such as a bean table and it lists all the materials you would need like a bean table or two or three large tubs or bowls of beans large spoons different colors cups funnels toy cars and trucks small baskets and other toys and containers then it goes down the list and you could uh, prompt sharing such as tommy hand susie the big scoop or the blue funnel or those sorts of things as you can see these are pretty advanced language ability so we need to know what big and small are we need to know colors which surprisingly gets taught much later than most kids get exposed to colors if they're not picking it up on their own um, the next activity is a birthday party where we would gather table chairs plates spoons Play-Doh that you can use to make pretend cakes, um, teapot or pitcher, uh, 10 pegs for use of candles, or you can use real candles. So what I have recommended to both teachers, these are preschool teachers or uh, autism support classroom teachers, is to make a couple of these boxes so you have the materials all together. So I would have in this birthday party box I might have the script on top and it's really important too that you don't use the script rotely every time the same and it's not to say that if they if the child doesn't know big and small you would just omit that that uh, you know, these are just ideas one of the problems with kids with autism they get very rote so I would have a bean table box uh, and then I would have a birthday party box of, of the materials already gathered. And that way we can kind of uh, go through some natural environment teaching, whether that's at the table or on the floor, um, whether that's in a classroom or at home. I just find that this book, starting at page 92, there's 20 activities. And you might even have other activities that you could just page through these and get some ideas. Okay, another great part of the book. So I like two major parts of this book. Um, the Playtime, Social Time book, page 136. We have scripts that teach, systematically teach social skills to small groups of children. So I have recommended these social skills groups. They're, they're more, um, they're scripts such as Language for Learning, um, direct instruction scripts. So we would have a small group of children. You could do this if you have multiple siblings at home um, or you're in a preschool or an ASD classroom, you could run this. Today, we're gonna to talk about sharing. Sharing is, you know, what are we gonna talk about today? And then the class would say sharing. Uh, if you have a child who's not talking, they are not ready for this. You have a child who doesn't understand any, you know, isn't, isn't able to label, to request items, that's really where you want to start back um, and teach them some beginning language before we get into this book. But I do know that there are many children who get up to this book um, or the, the um, play and social skill needs that this book covers, and I find it to be a great resource, especially since it's free. We are going to link that in the uh, right below. Uh, wherever you're watching or listening. So in summary, uh, and then play skills, independent play skills um, also are a whole different thing to teach. And we, maybe we'll do another session on that sometime. But um, 
these social skill play skills for kids with autism are super important to teach. Hopefully I gave you some good ideas on where to get started and to really look at the language ability of the child and the play and social abilities before we program way too high, before we expect things to come in naturally, and before we expect that just exposure to typically developing kids is going gonna, is gonna to work out well. I have found that if the adult really teaches a child how to play, we can often transfer these skills to playing with other kids, other typically developing kids, or kids with delays or disabilities. So I hope you enjoyed that short presentation on autism and play skills. And um, for more information about my courses and how you can get started with some of those major prerequisite skills, you can go and take the quiz at marybarbera.com forward slash quiz. I will now open it up for some questions. So hopefully, um, you all got a lot out of that. I am going to look in the comments and, um, see what kind of comments we get. And if you could, um, ask about, you know, social and play skills, that would be great. Um, so we do have a question that's not really a social skill question, but how do you suggest getting a three-year-old to stop taking from a baby bottle? I do have a, a video blog on that and a six steps to weaning from bottles and pacifiers that you can, uh, my staff can link. And also, you know, if you don't get the link, just marry autism bottle weaning and you will find the resource you need. That's the great thing. Since I've been doing video blogs for three and a half years and podcasts for a year and a half, um, most of what I have to say about any autism related topic is already out there. So get used to searching, uh, Mary autism and whatever. How verbal is Lucas now? Um, Lucas is 23. He remains very impaired with moderate to severe autism mild intellectual disability. So he is verbal. He can get his needs and wants me, uh, uh, requests out. He can answer simple questions. He can read a little bit. He can do math a little bit. Um, he can shower independently and those sorts of things. So, you know, one of the reasons why Lucas is so impaired is because I went into a deep state of denial from the time he was 21 months till he was 36 months uh, when he was finally diagnosed. So um, I have some guilt around that. And, you know, it is what it is. When you know more, you do better. Um, nobody has a crystal ball. Nobody can look back and say where Lucas would be if I had the information that I had now that I'm trying to get out to the world. Um, but Lucas, you know, both my kids, my, my, uh, younger son, Spencer just graduated from college this weekend. He is on his way to medical school in August. And what I want for both of my kids is I want them to be as safe as possible. And that looks different for Spencer and Lucas. Lucas needs, uh, supervision all the time. Spencer can fly on a plane to college. He can deal with all of his needs. Um, and he can remain safe by, you know, being careful going out late at night in a big city and those sorts of things. So I want both my kids to be safe, both my kids to be as independent as possible. That's the whole plane ride and that sort of thing. But Lucas is very independent with, uh, making meals, cleaning up, getting a shower, um, getting dressed, folding the wash. So there's always, you know, wherever their skills are. And then I want both my kids and all my clients and all of your kids uh, to be as happy as possible. And with Lucas, that means major problem behaviors now near zero. Um, and he's a big kid. He's, well, he's a, an adult. They're both adults now. Um, Lucas weighs over 200 pounds. So if he has aggression or self-injurious behavior or property destruction or anything like that, it is a big deal. So um, Lucas is now very calm and happy. Um, 
so and then of course spencer you know try to keep him happy and he's keeps himself happy he um so that's how verbal lucas is it's kind of a long answer um how do you get a toddler to be engaged with a toy or game or activity for a prolonged period of time my son doesn't seem to interested or lose interest very quickly with any activity yeah that's a great question um the best thing to do is is we with the toddler or early learner course we pair up the table and we pair up the early learner activities like the shoebox program potato head and some puzzles any toy that you're talking about we pair it up with our attention with other things that are reinforcing um, edibles we even use electronics at the table we um, and we extend it we go from five minutes to 15 minute sessions some parents and professionals are reporting in hour sessions now we need to mix it up make it fun make it appealing uh, what's in it for them is it too late for my four-year-old to start the course and get the same results as a two-year-old referring to your guilt with Lucas um it's never too late it's always best to start as early as possible our toddler and preschooler course does go through age four and then our other courses go you know some people start it at when they're teen um so yes it's never too late um you know would you get the exact same results no but you're going to be at a different starting point than lucas was um so everybody's at a different starting point and everybody you know i just talked to a mom last week she took took my toddler course just during shutdown two-year-old was just diagnosed right before COVID, covid shutdown she took my course her daughter she had this independent speech evaluation she was functioning at a zero to three month old level for language at two and fast forward just three months now she had a second speech therapy evaluation and she's functioning at a 30 month old level and now she's 26 months of age so three months of just my i was like i was talking to her on zoom and i was like really so you had no other therapy no um i had therapy before the COVID shutdown therapy before you know with little to no progress now we also in our toddler in our preschool i'm um, sorry in our verbal behavior bundle we had anna join our course years ago and our son was eight and a half and he had lots of therapy and lots of behavior analysts with little to no progress and she joined my course and she got him talking at, at eight and a half years now he's saying hundreds of words so it's never too late and it, you always you know i i say i have guilt and i do but um i did do you know besides being in denial um then i was like a nut job in terms of trying to get the right therapy in place um so uh, okay uh we have a person here from south africa my son is six and has autism and verbal but he can't tell me what happened he screams a lot and always went things to go his way he sleeps late um so I would just take the quiz and um, consider joining our verbal behavior bundle because like I'm just teaching about you for you know 20 or 30 minutes about play skills I mean it is complicated as you can see like a four-year-old a six-year-old this person screaming this kid is talking and almost conversational everybody's gonna have a different start and everybody's gonna you know just try to get them all to reach their fullest potential um I want my son to, to want to talk. I could see potential, but when I'm doing one-to-one -one with him, he just smiles. Any suggestions? It, it depends on what you're doing one-to-one -one with him. Um, we want to be doing one-to-one -one work that the child is like, is eagerly wanting to do. It's fun. It's animated. They want to talk. Um, they want your positive attention. It's great that he's smiling. I mean, that's one of my big three is happiness. Um, so getting kids to smile, even keeping track of smiles and laughs. And I want kids to have a very, um, all right. So marybarbera.com forward slash quiz is where you want to go to take the quiz, watch the workshop, and then you can consider 
uh, if you want to go farther with me. Do you have any podcasts or blog on teaching play skills? Yes, I have a couple. Just search Mary Barbera or Mary Autism Play Skills and you'll find all of them. The podcasts are 17, 18, uh, and a couple of video blogs. I even have a video blog on what to do when your child gets kicked out or held back or kicked out of daycare or preschool, um, which Lucas was held back when he was two. Um, but there's a lot of kids that are held back because they're not potty trained, held back because they're hitting other kids, they get kicked out for hitting or biting, um, held back for not drinking out of an open cup, for um, not being able to attend to circle time. These are all really real things that are happening to people. Can you please leave the link to join your toddler course? Um, actually, it's really best if you take the quiz and um, watch some of the, the webinar and just to make sure that you are you you do want to take the toddler course and you um, want to do a little bit of work to get your child attending. And um, I think that's that's definitely the best way to, to do it. Um, Okay. I have a couple of clients who have zero interest in playing with toys appropriately. Um, they like to stim with toys. How do I teach play skills if they're not interested? Yeah, so you have to um, find out what they're interested in. So if they, if I have a child, so I had a client once who just loved to like wave straws in front of their face and put straws in a clear bottle like that's what they they would do that for hours a day there's some kids that would just stack blocks hours a day there's some kids that watch the same movies for hours a day um so what we do is we some kids really like alphabet and they want to watch abcs and everything so we might take the shoe box and we might even though I don't want to teach a two or three year old letters and reading and shape that up, if they're highly motivated by that, I might use letter cards to get echoic control to hold up the letter P, 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 and they say it and they put it in. So um, I would focus largely on language and attending skills and getting the table paired up. Um, okay. If uh, there's a ton of questions, so if you have something that is a dire question and I haven't seen it yet, you may want to repost it now so I can see it. My son with autism, he's six. Uh, he's not interested in any play. If we do ball catching, uh, too, everything he feels as a task and I'm from India, what shall I do please? Um, you know, ball play is, is hard for some kids. They may need to start with, you know, a tub of water and, and ducks and foamy bath foam soap. I mean, who knows what kind of play is going to be highly motivating, uh, cause and effect toys, blowing bubbles, letting the bubble or the blow blowing balloons and letting the balloon, you know, fly. Um, just think about the kind of stim that they like with, with the client with the straws, for instance, and he liked to put things in. Well, a lot of our early learner materials within my online courses are putting things in. A lot of them are cause and effect. You know, you may have to go, even though your child's six, you may have to go back to infant toys. You may have to go back to hammer and ball toys meant for a two year old. You might think, well, that's not age appropriate. Well, if that's where the child is at in terms of language and play skills, you may actually have to go back there, um, which is tough for people. Do you have a social skills, play skills assessment? Um, part of my uh, one page assessment that I do uh, have for free is part of my three step guide. So you can go there at marybarbera.com forward slash join and get the free guide. So it's a one page assessment. So it looks at some social play skills, but it also looks at feeding, potty, sleep, uh, talking, receptively, uh, understanding language, uh, using, uh, answering WH questions or interverbal language. It talks about problem behavior. So it, within 10 minutes, you can get a quick snapshot of your child or clients. I have recommended that 
uh, professionals doing telehealth would complete the one-page assessment with the family to make sure you're you're working on the right skills because uh, it's a different it's a different ball game now that we're shut down. How can I start with ABA services having issues with insurance and there's also a lot of wait time with private agencies? Um, yeah, and that's really why I developed my online course uh, courses. That's why I'm doing my podcast. That's why I'm writing my ne next book because I need to empower parents to do it themselves, actually. Um, you are the one that is going to be the most motivated. And if you're a professional out there, you, my philosophy is we need to learn how best to do parent training because they are the ones that are going to really know how to do things. If you are looking for uh, professionals who might be using somewhat of my approach, I would look for professionals who are familiar with the VBMAP assessment. So I would Google autism, ABA, VB map, city, state, country. And that's where I would start. Um, and I would not um, get ABA services in place unless they were familiar with verbal behavior. I've seen a lot of ABA providers who are doing um, therapy that I just would not recommend. I do not recommend having kids cry. I do not recommend um, blocking kids at a table to make them learn. I don't think, uh, my, my approach is very child friendly. Uh, my approach can be taken by professionals and parents, my courses. So um, those are two ideas. Um, we are in Belize and autism isn't something that we have much help with here. How can I help my almost three year old learn to understand? Um, Understanding is, is like talking. We have to get them to understand and talk at the same time. So, you know, pairing water, water, water. Um, let them take a sip. Now I'm pairing it again, water, water, water. Not only will this hopefully teach them to express water next time, I might have to go with sign for water or drink, um, but they'll start putting the thought of this means water. So if I were going to go to another country, they, I didn't speak the language and they were talking like, here's some cold water with a green label. You want to drink, blah, 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 blah. But if somebody said, Ubi, 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 I would think, all right, I got to remember, Ubi is water. We want to do the same thing. We want to pair words slowly in an animated way. Um, my son is four and a half and does a lot of echolalia and scripting, how to deal with this. Yeah, I, I've done video blogs, podcasts on scripting and echolalia. Just search Mary Autism Echolalia, Mary Autism Scripting. You will find lots of things. But basically, the big thing you want to do is you need to keep the child engaged for long periods of the day and not let them stim. Um, on the same movies over and over again or not let them stem on the same iPad apps or um, those sorts of things. And it may have to be a gradual. I'm not like a big cold turkey take electronics away because as a parent I know that to keep my child safe and now my young adult safe, he does spend quite a bit of time using his iPad with a CD player but I know then I could take a shower and he's going to be safe. He's not going to leave the house. He's not going to take markers and write on the walls. So I am not opposed to some uh, electronic time. But um, especially since the COVID shutdown, we have to do a better job of keeping our kids engaged with the right level of instruction and the right reinforcement. And that is a tricky balance. Many of my students with significant language delays have IEP goals written with peer interactions as a requirement. After hearing your talk, I realize that it's way too high for most of them. Is it reasonable to write goals for the prerequisites? Absolutely. Um, the VB map actually has some IEP suggested goals. I think if you go to ABB Press, uh, Applied Verbal Behavior, ABB Press, Dot com go under downloads bb map downloads and i believe he has mark sunberg has um 
IEP goals based on the VB map. So you'd want to go to those baby IEP goals. Um, also within our course, we have we talk about IEP goals all the time, and uh, we talk about how to deal with school districts, whether you're on you know either side of the table in terms of an IEP meeting, but making sure that um, kids have the right goals in place. Part of my three-step guide is the assessment is step one, which is a free one-page assessment. I also have a one-page plan and making sure that you and the parent are on the same page in terms of what is important to work on. Um, and, uh, and then the third step is to use a calendar system and to help parents use a calendar system to keep track of problem behaviors. Shannon is from my courses, a five-year-old with good independent play now due to quarantine, he has regressed with lining them up again. Yeah, that's, it's tough. There's so many kids regressing now um, because there's so many hours in a day without structure. Um, you may, I, I know you, Shannon, I recognize your name, so I know you're in our courses. So I would post this question um, to our private group, but um, keeping him busy, maybe alternating um, where he's not able to, um, you're rotating, you're rotating his toys, um, you know, getting, putting some, like say there's ABC blocks or there's cars and it's just hours of nonstop lining up. You may want to put those, those specific toys away for a while. Uh, try to engage him, try to, you know, this, this play um, book may really come in handy with some new ideas. Uh, just make sure it doesn't get too scripty and make sure you're pretty involved with this. Okay. Mia, how do you suggest uh, working with a child who is most of the time not motivated to do table time, having offered all his favorite toys edibles since you don't encourage blocking to stay on task? Yeah, so one of the big things, Mia, is you need to have the room uh, selected that is pretty sanitized. Like there's not a whole lot of fun other things to do. Um, and you have really the good stuff right at the table and the rest of the room is pretty sterile. There's not a lot going on. Um, and so if they're leaving, if the child's leaving and not wanting to stay at the table, then I would see what he's doing. Um, and I would see, I would be thinking, okay, this is not reinforcing enough. What else do I need? I usually recommend two edibles, a drink, an electronic, some toys. Um, and, uh, you have to look at what you're doing at the table too. That has to be fun. That has to be at his level or even a little babyish for him. We want him to be highly successful. So it's a whole uh, system, but yeah, I would not block kids at a table. I would not block them anywhere, not hold them down unless it was like a life threatening medical procedure that you have to, because what happens when you hold kids down and force kids to do anything, it could very well, uh, go into other areas and start causing problems. Amy said, and Amy's a top fan Thank you for being here and being a top fan. Uh, with my students, before I even encourage peer interaction goals, I make sure the student knows the foundational skills for playing, such as turn-taking, sharing. First step, they learn how to engage in those behaviors with me before the expectation of having peer interactions is even proposed. Yeah, that's excellent. It's just that there's a whole lot of kids that haven't, that just do not understand turn-taking, sharing, uh, they're back to just needing to accept uh, reinforcement, being able to mand with words or signs or pictures for those basic things, being able to follow simple directions, being able to imitate. Um, I would rather, you know, work on object imitation and gross motor imitation before I work on turn-taking with a peer. Um, because you're building these skills for lots of areas, including peer turn taking. My son is nine and nonverbal. And when we teach him to sound or try to say words, we see him really try, but struggles to pronounce the words sort of, they won't come out right. Uh, 
example food he will say the f sound how can we teach him yeah um there's a, a diagnosis that a lot of kids with autism also get called apraxia and it really um ha kids have a hard time pronouncing words my in my courses i talk about um really thinking of any sounds the child makes uh independently um like ah or o oh, or e or or maybe they say hi maybe they say bye or maybe bye sounds like ba so if they say ba or ma um we want to get sounds under echoic control first um and we want to practice those words or sounds that the child can make um and if in the case where a nine-year-old is is sounds like he has apraxia whether that's diagnosed or not is not a big deal but um yeah i i would work with a speech pathologist too um to shape up language four-year-old is passive in pure play he's verbal with a large vocabulary how can i help i do think that if a four-year-old um, is verbal with large uh, vocabulary that this book, Playtime, Social Time, which you can download for free. It, the link is here in, in the show notes, but if you um, forget about it, you could just Google Mary, or no, you don't even have to Google Mary but Barbera. You can just Google Playtime, Social Time, uh, and a PDF or free book or whatever, and you can find the link. That's how I found the link. I had bought this book, um, but I found the link, re you know, years ago, and it's just been a great resource for people. My son is two and a half, 2.6, and I'm trying to potty train him, but he's not eliminating without having iPad or iPhone in his hands. If we don't give it to him, he starts crying and tries to pinch down there. Yeah, so um, potty training is like a whole nother thing. Your son is only two and a half years old, though, and if he has other needs, such as crying, whining, pinching, not talking, those sorts of things. It may actually be a little too early to focus on potty training. And I talk about that. Um, I do have a free video blog, a free 20 page ebook, all at marybarbera.com forward slash potty. Amy agrees that imitation skills are huge. Many of the kiddos in the life skills program I work with do have imitation skills. Joint attention is so important to work on as well. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, all righty. So we are at the top of the hour. I know I didn't get to every question, um, but, you know, I got to a bunch and I think we had a good session. So I, I think I'm going to head, head on out. But um, don't forget, download your book, uh, Playtime Social Time. Uh, if you have a child who's met some of the prerequisites and, and is ready for some instruction, but don't program too high. Don't expect just exposure to typical peers is going to do, uh, what you need it to do. And don't expect these play skills and, and social skills to come naturally. You, whether you're a parent or professional can have a big part in helping a child reach their fullest potential in terms of play and social skills. So I will be back here uh, next Monday, 1 p.m. Eastern time, same time, same place, uh, with another uh, Facebook Live. So I hope that you join me here uh, next Monday. Have a great week, and I'll see you soon.